All right. Let's get started tonight. We're going to begin with uh, uh, prayer. Matt Yomi just announced prayer meeting tomorrow night. Don't forget, uh, tomorrow night at 6, we're going to get together and pray for our nation. Pray that God would work His perfect will and whatever He's doing with our nation. Uh, nothing wrong with praying for peace, praying for God's revival, for our national revival, that God would maybe give us that grace that we need, another chance to get things right. And um, so we'll be praying tomorrow night at 6 here in the Fellowship Hall if you want to join us. And um, I mentioned this morning briefly that I will be out. Uh, uh, I may be here, but I'll be not going to be in the office all the days next couple of weeks. I'm going to take some vacation time. And uh, Brother Jimmy is going to preach next Sunday morning. And then the following Sunday morning, uh, Brother Hugh, Brother Whalen is going to preach that morning, and we're going to do some things. They're going to do some things at night. So uh, anyway, you just plan to be here. Going to be a lot going on. I plan to be here uh, for those events, and uh, just not going to be taking all the preparation time that that comes in with the week. So, but if you need me, you call. Okay, uh, if there's a real need there, you don't be afraid to let me know about it. Okay, I'll be, I'll be in and out. Let's open with prayer, and we'll get started. Yes, sir. Next Saturday? The 9th, yes. The 9th is the last day. Okay. Uh, speaking of that, we do need to get, I, I don't know where we stand on shoebox stuff that you need. Is there some specific things that you need? When you say gloves, you're talking about like little mittens, kids, kids gloves or mittens, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And again, if you want to just give Miss Jan a few dollars, she can take the money she needs and pick up the things that she doesn't have. And uh, we're trying to get at least a hundred shoe boxes this year. We 150. Amen. We need them. To be honest, I, I haven't talked to them. No, they haven't called us. Uh, uh, Watson has helped us. Uh, Watson Baptist has helped us the last few years with shoe boxes, but they are not. Uh, they've had a change in pastors and leadership, and I don't know if they have interest in it or not. But um, I am going to kind of lead the group this year. Um, Mr. Mark Taylor, who's been going leading the group, uh, his wife's been in the hospital, almost died, and so he doesn't feel like he can go, so I'm going to have to go lead the group. There's five of us that'll be going, and uh, we'll all be driving one truck, pulling the Open Door Missions trailer that we have, and carrying the shoe boxes out there, so keep us in your prayers that I can stay awake for 20 hours of driving in two days. <laughs> so, huh? Miss Dawn's glad I'm not going. She's not going since uh, since I'm driving. But um, now it's four of us. We'll share the driving. We'll split the responsibilities up. So um, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll get started. Uh, by the way, that group's not leaving till Saturday after Thanksgiving. Normally we leave on Friday, but we're leaving Saturday, be coming back on the following Saturday. All right. No, but we we pride, we need to have them by that Wednesday anyway, if we can, uh, or if we can have them earlier, you know, do them on Monday night or something like that, and then we try to get them all packed in the trailer, so by Saturday they're ready to roll. All right? Yeah. Okay. What we do usually have a big night where they put together shoe boxes and wrap them and stuff like that. And it's a lot of fun. If you had to be in, y'all need to come. Yeah, it's a good thing to be involved in. It really is. 
see a lot of mission work going on in one pro one big get together. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Chance we have to come together to worship, Lord, to study your word. God, just uh, watch out for our nation this week, Lord. So much danger, so much could happen, so much, Lord, uh, in a turn if we as a nation, where do we go spiritually, morally? God, what kind of nation we will be. We put that matter in your hands. We don't, we don't even know all the, we don't even have all the information. And God, we just ask for your wisdom in this time of the year. And God, we ask for you to um, guide us. We ask you, Lord, to help us, even as we come to the point of, of mission work, Father, and all the projects in Zambia and the work that's going on in Ukraine, and, and then, God, for the work in New Mexico with the Native Americans, Lord, we ask your help. We ask you to provide those things that we need, Lord, that we may be a blessing, that we may share the gospel with those families. I thank you for what you're going to do. I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, God, just be the guide, the joy in our lives, Father, the one who inspires. Help us to trust you listen to you, learn from you, and to follow you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Amen. Good evening. Y'all want to stand and sing? Let's stand and sing. Y'all get that blood flowing. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? a friend or brother tell it to Jesus alone do the tears flow down your cheeks and bitter tell it to Jesus tell it to Jesus have you sins that to men's eyes are hidden tell it to Jesus alone tell it to Jesus tell it to Jesus he well known you've no other such a friend or brother tell it to Jesus alone are you troubled at the thought of dying tell it to Jesus tell it to Jesus for Christ's coming kingdom are you sighing tell it to Jesus alone Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus, He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother, tell it to Jesus alone. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadow dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. The Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Feel my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love Oh, what a standing is mine And 
the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came took the offer of grace he did proper he saved me oh praise his dear name heaven came down and glory filled my soul filled my soul when at the cross the Savior made me whole made me whole my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day heaven came down and glory filled my soul filled my soul now i have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time i have a future in heaven for sure there in no mansion sublime and if it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe, rich is eternal and blessed is supernal. From his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away. And my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. My soul. Amen. Again, you got to hear a little bit of it there. I tell you what, the Lord probably rejoices in Sam's singing as much as any of us. Because he makes a joyful noise to the Lord. All right. Is that right? That's right. It's my pet monkey. That's right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 30 years. Can you believe we've been friends for 30 years, Sam? Yeah. He said he can believe it. He, he's... It's a big deal. Guess what? This is Sam's birthday. Today is Sam's birthday. Believe it or not, he is 68 years old. Yeah, getting old like me. <laughs> yeah, you sure are, Sam. You done pass me up, Sam. Pass me up. Well, tonight have another blessed subject to talk about, marriage and divorce. I've been, I've been just looking forward to it all week long. But we do need to know what the Bible says about the subject, don't we? Again, I remind you from next week that it is not, you got that video? It is not, uh, we're not talking about your past. You deal with your past, get it, anything. If you've got something there, put it under the blood, forget it, move on. But we're talking about the future. Okay, marriages have not been a lot of not been very well trained, and uh, there's a lot of poor training has gone into marriages. It reminds me of this military training video of Iraqi soldiers. This is about how well we've trained for marriage. Go ahead and play it, Daniel. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's about how we've trained for marriage right there. So uh, that's the only thing I could think of that would compare. Okay, you can turn it off before I get sick. But uh, that's about like our marriage training right there. And um, I thought to myself that um, we could stand a lot more. There ought to be a lot of classes you have to go through before you get married. <laughs> you know, some training, some preparation, uh, I always have people ask me things, and I learned, I've learned a lot through the years about um, just expectations, desires, and, and the difference, so many of the, the emotional differences in men and women, and uh, expectations, um, and so, so anyway, tonight we're going to look at it in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 8, okay, beginning in verse 8. Just what does the Bible say about this subject? Uh, listen close. If you're not married, there's things to learn. And uh, even things for those that are married. It says in verse 8, 
But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. You remember Paul talked about that. He was talking about celibacy a lot in the first part of this chapter. Paul says it's okay if they remain single. They do not have to be remarried. Uh, there is a word over in, in Titus where Paul is talking to, Tim, to Titus. And he's talking to him about marriage. And he says of those widows... He said if there are young widows, because they were talking about the responsibility of the church to take care of those widows. He said for the older widows, definitely make that effort and take care of them. He said, but for the younger widows, he said, I would recommend that they remarry instead of the church becoming a total church responsibility that they first attempt to, uh, to, to marry again if that's what God has for them. So anyway... Verse 9, he says, but if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. That's what he'd been talking about. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Where's Wayne? Wayne, uh, Wayne I'm not cold, but I know some of, these, some of these are shaking. It's so cold. Can we turn the air off? No, don't turn it off. You see, that's my problem right there. That's my problem right now. The air is blowing. It's some folks are freezing and some folks are sweating. I see some folks, y'all got blankets. Well, don't, don't turn it off, Wayne. Just, just cut it up a little bit. Okay. And that side's still blowing. For all of you who have no thermostat, for all of you that have no thermostat, move over here quickly. Move over here quickly. So you can, uh, you can have passion. Hugh, Hugh just sweats and dies and goes crazy. <laughs> now he says in verse 10, Let's go back there. Now, to the married, I command ye, yet not to, not but I, but the Lord. And uh, uh, Paul emphasizing the, whose authority this is coming from. A wife is not to depart from her husband. Okay? But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And the husband is not to divorce his wife. And we'll give some other scriptures on that. Uh, let's just pause right there before we go to any other scriptures and talk about them. If you have your worksheet tonight, your outline, uh, again, we're talking about what God says about marriage. It's not our opinions. It's not the, the law of necessarily the law of some state, but what does God say? Number one, the, single, the singles and self-control. He stresses in verses 8 and 9 how important that is. Uh, he says uh, that... And A, under that, or one under that, the benefits of being unmarried. He talks about those that are, that are unmarried, how great it would be. When he talks about them remaining single as he is, he's talking about so they will have more time to do ministry stuff is what he's talking about. More time to, to be involved in missions and things because they don't have big family responsibilities at that point. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> in discussing that, it's... Uh, uh, family takes a lot of time. We talked about that last week. And, and some folks can just let their commitment at that point be to, uh, to do the ministry, the work of the ministry. And so that's what Paul is referencing there. Number two there, the burden of being unmarried. There is a, a burden to that. There's uh, challenges. There's responsibilities. But the burden of that also, uh, temptation and that desire. He talks about... Uh, not burning with passion is acted for someone who is unmarried that that just can't stand not having a, a personal relationship with someone. If you just can't live that way, he says you should should be remarried, and uh, and so don't just take after a marriage. Don't just then just just decide. Well, I'm just going to live a sexually immoral life. Uh, don't I'm not going to worry about marriage. I'm just going to live an immoral life. No, God's saying don't do that. Okay, second thing I want you to see is the scriptures on divorce. The first one was singles and self-control. Here's the scriptures on divorce. Verses 10 and 11 is pretty clear, isn't it? To the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. He makes it real clear. Uh, There's a difference in what he is saying. God tells you what's in verses 10 and 11. Now, we're going to see when we get down to verse 12, some of this is Paul's views, things that the Holy Spirit is telling Paul coming directly from him. He's quoting Scripture in, these, in verses 10 and 11. 
He's quoting scriptures, and we'll give reference to those scriptures. So what do the scriptures say? Well, the first verse 10 talks about how God speaks on divorce. God speaks on divorce. Daniel, if you'll put that one up there. Uh, how important that is for us to understand. <clears throat> A wife is not to depart from her husband. Okay? That's God's ideal. That's God's way of saying that's what we desire to do. Work through the hard times. Work through those times. Don't just give up. Don't just quit. Let me give you some examples of that in, in verses of Scripture. You see out beside that I have... Uh, let's start with Mark first before we... In Malachi, basically Malachi talks about how many, how many times do men, really the references to the man, just giving up on the marriage and uh, leaving the, what he calls the wife of his youth and running off to, to play games, you know, and, and live in the world. And so he's saying don't do that. And uh, the Scripture is real clear when it says to us there about how important it is to, in Malachi to raise godly offspring and the challenge of that. But it also real clearly tells us in those verses that God hates divorce. So don't, don't ever say God's okay with divorce, all right? And, and again, I don't know how many of you here maybe have gone through a divorce. This is not a criticism. This is just simply saying that God's, that's not God's ideal. Is it the unpardonable sin? No, it's not. It's not the unpardonable sin. It's not something God can't forgive, okay? But is it sin? Can I be honest? It is sin according to God, okay? It is a sin, but so is telling a lie. So is taking something that doesn't belong to you, all right? So is uh, a lot of things that we know from the Bible. There's a lot of sin. Divorce is one of those that God looks at, and he calls it what it is, but yet it's something that God can forgive. And so, but it says here that God hates uh, divorce in verse 16 of Malachi chapter 2. But I'm not going to read all that, but it's unique. We get a lot out of the places where Jesus actually talked about it. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 2, the Pharisees came and asked him, Y'all okay with me talking to you about this tonight? Y'all okay with that? Huh? I'm going to do it whether you're okay with it or not. I just kind of wanted to know whether you were okay with it. Uh, <laughs> I love that. I love doing that. I love just play. It's the word. Is it lawful, verse 2 of Mark 10, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. They were test Jesus got tested a lot to see whether his answers would go along with Scripture. Okay? And so Jesus obviously is going to stand with Scripture. He answered and said to them, verse 3, what did Moses tell you? <laughs> you know, Jesus is going to go back and say, well, it's not about my opinion. What, what, what did Moses teach you about marriage and divorce? And they said to him, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. To dismiss her. All right. Let me tell you what a certificate of divorce was. In the Old Testament, uh, you could, if your wife had done something, uh, something that, uh, for example, if, if a man found his wife had had an affair or something that, it got so liberal, if she burned the toast, you could write a, a written divorce. I mean, if you didn't like what she cooked for breakfast, you could, you could kick her to the curb, okay? And uh, that's how bad it got, especially with, the, with the, uh, the Sadducees, who were much more liberal. Uh, they just ended marriages for any reason. Uh, Pharisees were much more conservative, but yet they still had reasons, a lot of reasons. And so you could just basically decide that she's not satisfying you and you want to kick her to the curb, Okay. And so he goes on to answer and says, and Jesus answered and said to them. Now, they were using that as saying, see, we can, let, we can just get rid of our wives for the least little thing. Jesus answered and said to him, because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, and that goes way back there, doesn't it? From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, he said, quoting scripture, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. And he quotes it and goes on and says, and the two will become one flesh. Then they are no longer two, but one flesh. 
Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. See, that's what God says about the subject. I mean, that means that word uh, glued together, as I've, you've heard me say before, that, that they should try to stay together, work through all the good, the bad, all the problems. And so he says, uh, and verse 10 says, And in the, in the house, his disciples also asked him again about the same manner. And so he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And, if, and if, if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. So he's just talking about if we get out of that relationship, is it the sin of adultery? If you say it is, it's still a forgivable sin. Adultery is forgivable. It's not the unpardonable sin, okay? And so some people look at it as like, well, your life is over if you have a divorce. God never said that, okay? So... That's where we are on the subject. Divorce is, is something that God doesn't desire. And, in fact, in other places where this is referred to, uh, and, and even here where it's referred to, when he said, because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote to you. Jesus gave clarification of what this meant. He said, because you aren't willing to forgive each other. You aren't willing sometimes to work together. He, he's not talking about everybody, but he's saying you don't just run and throw your marriage away the first time you have a disagreement about something. You try to work through it. And he said, some of you, you just got hard hearts, and you don't want to work through your problems. You won't compromise. You won't find common ground, and you just give up when you don't get your way. So that's what Jesus is stressing here. Moses, yeah, Moses gave you a writ of divorce. I think it's Matthew's gospel where he says, yeah, he gave you a writ of divorce. But he gave it to you because you weren't willing to forgive one another. Now, some marriages, we never go a lot deeper than that, don't we? And we'll address some of that in these other verses coming up in 1 Corinthians and what God says about that. But, but God speaks on divorce here. He, he, Jesus gives us here in, in Mark uh, what God says. One other verse I want you to see. Uh, and number two on your line up there, God's specifics for those who divorce. Verse 11. God's specifics. Let's read verse 11. It says, But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and the husband is not to divorce his wife. What he's talking about there is not giving up on that. Not giving up on that marriage. He's saying, you know, still try to work things out. That's the, that's the, the emphasis right there. Now, if you were to come to me and say, okay, what is that saying, Pastor? Don't do that tonight because I don't want to have to answer that, okay? Uh, but he says, if, he said, if you do get divorced, remain unmarried or be reconciled to your husband. So basically he's saying that's the ideal. Don't just, don't just the first time. If, again, you're, playing, you're putting into context here the writ of divorcement. What you're, con you're putting into context how they were ending marriages in their time. And he's saying, don't just... Go do a writ of divorcement. Get rid of your wife. Go out and marry somebody else. Keep that one a few months and get rid of her. And then keep that one a few months and get rid of her. That's not, you're not in the marrying process. You're not just moving from one woman to the next. That's not what God endorses here. Okay? So he's saying even don't give up. Brother Hugh, been through that, hadn't you? Brother Hugh and Miss Stacy divorced one time. <laughs> well, I, I didn't want to say that, but they divorced two times. <laughs> And remarried two times. Did you know that? I don't know how many of you knew that, but they've been, they've been through that. They didn't give up. And they, they worked it out. And, uh, but, and I think it'd be fair to say, probably when they went through that divorce, you weren't f living for the Lord in those times. There wasn't any forgiveness and any grace and any understanding. And uh, uh, they were ready to kill each other. But anyway, just moving right along. Uh, uh, I guess there's a good, there's a, there's a positive thing in that. There's a positive thing in that, that they didn't give up. And even though they went through the hard times and didn't know how to compromise, they, they worked it out. And so Deuteronomy, look, under that, Deuteronomy, uh, and, and basically God is saying to us here, be patient in these relationships. Show, be patient, be gracious, be forgiving. Deuteronomy 24, the first four verses says, when a man takes a wife, just to show that this is coming from the Bible, what Jesus says, uh, when a man takes a wife, marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes, 
because he has found some uncleanness in her. Now this is, who's writing this? Who's writing Deuteronomy 24? Moses. So this is a reference to what Moses said. He finds, some, he, when he's found, she has no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her. And he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. Now, you can just look at that and say, well, that's what the Pharisees and Sadducees were doing. She wasn't favoring. She wasn't doing what they wanted. And they just wrote her a piece of paper and said, hit the road, sister. Right? Isn't it amazing that it talks a lot about the men doing that to the ladies, and there's not much talk about the ladies doing that to the men. And when it says... Because she is, he has found some uncleanness in her, that's because when he married her, and then after they were married, he found that she was not a virgin. Okay? He could divorce her if he married her and found that she had already, she was not a virgin. And he, that gave them a right to divorce. And that's what Moses had taught, okay? And he goes on and says, when she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, sends her out of his house, and if the latter husband dies, who took her as his wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she's been defiled, after she's had another marriage relationship, for that's an abomination before the Lord. You shall not bring, bring sin on the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. Now, we understand that's part of the law. Okay, does that mean that's no good to us? Does that mean it doesn't count to us? No, what it means is some of those specifics right there that, isn't it amazing? Aren't you glad that grace has taken over some things? Has taken over and we don't always live by every, every little minor detail of the law, which basically says if someone were to, be, to go and be remarried, then you can't take her back, you know, and... Uh, Again, you, if you were to sit here and ask me, well, what about this situation and that situation and that situation? I can't answer all that, and I don't think anybody can. Uh, you know, could somebody that's been married to another person come back and be remarried to that first person? I think under the grace of God in the New Testament, I would say yes. I think that person could do that. I don't think I could say, well, no, you can't marry her again. You know, we're going to leave that up to God. Listen, folks, there's a lot of things in the Bible we don't have 100% clarity on. Some of that stuff, that's why the Holy Spirit that lives in us is going to not give us something contradictory to the Bible. I'm just saying there's a difference in the law and there's a difference in grace. How important it is for us to understand that God says, uh, basically the whole theory here is that a woman should not go out and remarry, and remarry, and remarry. And the woman is referenced here in the Old Testament. But that's, I believe, because the reference is usually to mankind, I believe the same reference applies to men too. I don't think, it, I don't think it's just saying, well, this woman can't do this, but a man can. No, that's not what the Bible's teaching. It's talking about mankind, okay? And so, so don't think we're just talking about women and not talking about men here because that's not the case. Let's move on to number 12. I want to get off... Huh? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of things in the Old Testament. I still believe the Old Testament's the Word of God. I still believe it's there for us. It's our law. It's our school teacher. It's our history. I'm not saying it's definitely not saying it's not valuable. But when grace came on the scene, uh, the specifics of some of these things, I believe God uses that. To give us grace. And so. Uh, that's right. Exactly. Exactly right. And, and, and you know that can even happen. That can even happen for somebody. That. Uh, I've heard people say. Well if, if a divorce or something came before you got married. God erases all that. I'm, I'm going to say to you today. Before you became a Christian, I want to say to you today, even if you got divorced after you were a Christian, God can forgive that too, okay? So it's not like saying that, well, it had to happen before you got married. I just want to make sure we're clear. We make that clear that you can also uh, get God's forgiveness even if you are married. A lot of things that happen like this, 
that is spoken of in Deuteronomy 24, it really is what it does. It causes us to miss the blessings of God. It causes us to get off of God's road sometimes. And how many of us have, you ever been driving on the road at night and you just ran off the road? I don't mean bad, but I mean you swerved off the road and got back on. Sometimes we do that with our spiritual lives. We, we get off the road. We miss the road. We miss a turn, and we miss God's will, and we got to get it straightened out. And that's what life is. Life's about God fixing us. When we run off the road, God getting us back on the right road. And the law in the Old Testament is God's ideal. It is God's saying, okay, here is the ideal. What does the New Testament say? It says, if that's the hundred for the test... You failed. You know, are you with me? This is what is perfect in the eyes of God, but you didn't qualify, and I didn't qualify, and we need to be saved by the grace of God. So what you're reading here is the ideal, perfect will of God. If everything were perfect and there was no sin in the world, this is the way it would be done. But that's not the world we live in, is it? We live in a world that needs a lot of grace and a world that needed to be saved. Okay? Any other comments before we move on? Good. No comments. Let's move on. <laughs> Number three, the submission of marriage. The submission of marriage. And Now, Paul here moves to a little bit different uh, attitude, if you will, uh, when Paul says, verse 12, he says, But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, If any brother has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. Now, it's talking there about what we're talking about here is having a believer and an unbeliever together. He's saying if a man has a wife who's not a believer, and if she's willing to live with him, if they're willing to continue this marriage on, uh, because he had already taught us, and he will teach us more about this this, uh, relationship that is... uh, uh, that is a not unequally yoked a relationship, how important it is in marriage for us to be have the same views, have the same theology, um, and, and to be yoked together. And uh, here he's saying that if two people, if one is saved, one is not saved, they don't have to end their marriage. He's not saying they don't have to go out and get a divorce once, they get, once one of them gets saved. Verse 13 says, But a woman who has a husband who does not believe... And he is, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. All right? Um, one other verse, verse 16. I just want to skip down a couple. For how do you know, how do you know a, wife, a wife, whether you will save your husband, or how you will know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? In other words, you get that opportunity to bring them to know Christ. And how many of you, how many of you here, when you got saved, one of you was a Christian and one of you wasn't? Okay, Mark, Brenda, Lisa, anybody else? I, that's, that's not God's ideal. That's not the perfect situation. Hopefully, hopefully two people get married, they've got the same God, they're serving the same, they believe the same, they're pulling in the same direction and not going in different directions. Okay? And uh, what God is saying here is that is not uh, God's ideal, but yet don't give up because as Mark and Brenda obviously uh, can say that uh, I assume you were saved already, and Brenda, he was a heathen when you married him, right? He still, I still see some fruits of that in his life. Amen. <laughs> but, but how many people have I talked to over the years that even though one was saved, one wasn't saved, later, later on, they both were saved. One got saved, the other one got saved, and one had an impact on the other one. But that may happen, but that may not happen too. And that may lead to problems when, let's say, the children come along and she's wanting them to get up and go to church and he's wanting them to get up and go do something else. He doesn't want them to be a part of church. Uh, uh, there's, there's just a lot of things we can disagree about if one's a Christian and one's not a Christian. And so, anyway, he's saying, if you're okay with that, stay with that. Maybe we want to be saved through that. So uh, the permanent, verses 12 and 13, I, I put in the outline, the permanence of, of uh, unequal marriage. Don't give up on it. It's not God's ideal situation, but, but not to be just walked away from. Number two, the purpose of unequal marriage. 
is that maybe one might win the other one. Their first mission field is going to be try to win their spouse to Christ. And so, um, 1 Peter chapter 3, if we, I'm not going to take the time to turn over there, but it talks, about, it talks about the husband and wife, and it talks about the responsibility of how a woman, write that down if you want to read it a little later, 1 Peter chapter 3, it talks about how a woman might win her husband to the Lord. And it says it's not necessarily by putting on all the foo-foo juice and all the, all the, the jewels and, and, and by, by doing a lot of things that the world might think is the most important thing. But it's instead, and I'm summarizing this, it's basically by letting them see Jesus in you. You're not going to win them by nagging at them. You're not going to win them. And that's, that's what, basically what Scripture is saying there. You're not going to win them by beating them over the head with the Bible, all right? By punishing them with Scripture, by punishing them in your intimate relationship. You're not going to win them by those kind of things. He says the way you win them is by letting them see Christ in you and them see something that they don't have. I tell uh, marriages all the time, if, if one is saved and the other is not saved, you get up and come on to church every Sunday, whether he or she comes with you or not. You come on and be here. Be here. Let them see. They need to see that that's important in your life. And then how you live the rest of the week needs to stand up with the fact that what you're saying on Sunday that you stand for, you need to live it the rest of the week. And so uh, the Bible's pretty clear about that. And uh, Ephesians 5 is another one that talks about the man winning his wife through, through giving himself as Christ gave himself for the church. And so how important those things are. First Peter 3 talks about the wife winning the husband. Ephesians 5 talks about the husband winning the wife. And, and how he may model Christ's likeness in giving himself for that wife. All right, number four, the sanctification of marriage. Verse 14 talks about that when it says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Now, this is confusing. Uh, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But now they are holy. Now, Brother Jimmy is going to get up and explain this for us, how... Brother Jimmy, you have to be ready in season and out, brother. To, to it's, out <laughs> it's out season. It's out of season right now. <laughs> um, you know, does that mean if one is saved, then automatically both are saved? Is that what it means? He's saved just because she's saved. He, he's in the same house, and they're both going to go to heaven because she's saved. No, it's not what he's talking about. But the word sanctified is a term that is used here to... Uh, to talk about the, the, the home being different, being set apart, the home being special to God. If, if, if there's a saved person in that home, it's a home God's going to watch closely. It's a home that God wants to bless. He's going to experience some of the blessings because of her walk with God, or she's going to experience some of the blessings because of his walk with God. And in other words, that home is going to have that third party, God, kind of in the mix with that home, even though one of them is not saved. The Holy Spirit is going to be there in that home because she brings the Holy Spirit into that home. And I think that's the best that I can probably uh, explain it. Under uh, One, under that, marriage vows are honored by God. Don't, don't forget that. Verse 14, uh, it talks about that God looks at, God honors those uh, those vows that are made. You know that God, the Old Testament talks about that a lot. When you vow a vow, it says do what you vowed to do. I mean, God takes your vows seriously in anything, whatever it may be. But specifically in marriage too. God, when you stand before God and you take vows, I mean, your commitment ought to be that I'm going to keep that vow if, if at all possible. Now, there's scriptures that talks about if the other one departs and leaves you. I mean, there's nothing you can do about that if you're abandoned. Uh, but you do your part to keep that vow very serious. Um, 
you know, Adam Clark commentary, I read some things about this where basically uh, this is referring to, is not talking about salvation, but it's talking about that in this home, in this marriage, even though one is only saved, it is a setting apart that God does. God still has a special place for that family. God still has work to do in that family. God's still involved in that marriage through that one that is saved. And so uh, I think the point of this is that if you marry someone that's not saved, that's not God's ideal, okay? But if you marry someone that's not saved, God's just not going to automatically be against this marriage and automatically do everything he can to stop this marriage, to destroy this marriage because he doesn't like it. It's saying God still cares about that home and God's going to have a special purpose for that home and even maybe help that if the wife is saved, help her reach the husband. And so but God sanctifies that home and protects that home. Number two, children are holy in the eyes of God. The last part of that verse uh, where it talks about it, your children would be unclean, but they are not, but they are holy. And, and, and basically, a reference to that, it means that they're going to be there under the watchful eye of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit's going to still move in their life. God still desires to see them saved. And God will watch over that family because of that godly parent okay all right number the last one the separation of marriage verses 15 and 16 uh, when marriage does begin to kind of unravel and come apart verse 15 says but if the unbeliever departs let him depart a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases but God has called us to peace if two people are married, one's saved, one's not saved, and all of a sudden that unbeliever says, I'm tired of this, I'm not going to be in this marriage anymore, and is saying, you keep doing everything you can to make that marriage, don't give up on the, the believer, you don't give up on that marriage, but if he leaves, or if she leaves, okay, what's well, some of Wayne's magic going on back there? <laughs> yeah, that was because we weren't expecting the time change. I guess that's the heater, right, Wayne? Uh, working over there uh, for the water. <laughs> but uh, that's God reminding us to keep the baptistry waters stirring. Don't let them get soiled back there. So he's saying here, uh, this is one of the things that God will release you in marriage, one of the things that God will release you from your marriage vows if the unbeliever departs. It's not what God wants, it's not what God desires, but if it happens, God's not going to hold it against you for them ending that marriage and walking away from that marriage. Um, but, but God's emphasis there, uh, number one under that, if two people part, do so in peace. It's always amazing to me to see how marriages, when they end, how sometimes some people fuss and fight. I mean, I think if they, if they didn't keep guns out of reach, there'd be a, it'd be the old west between those two people. But then I always have been impressed with people who maybe were married, their marriage ended, and now they still have a peaceful relationship. They can still talk to each other and get along and, and because that's what God's desire is. That's what God's saying. And in fact, if that spouse was ever, you know, if there was ever a chance of you renewing that marriage, uh, that that's obviously the best way to do it is out of a peaceful relationship and not out of a, a wartime relationship. And the last thing, number two there, how we act when we're parting, when we're separating, can save our partner. And that's what I'm saying, verse 16, he goes on and, and again to reference that verse again for how do you know a wife whether you'll save your husband or how the husband, whether you'll be saved the wife. And, and that, I think that ought to be something that ought to always be in our minds if we have an, an unsaved marriage partner that we, that in that situation we, we try to find, we still have a desire in our heart to see that person be saved. You know, I believe you could even be divorced from somebody and still want to see that person saved, still want to see them come to Christ. And so he's saying there, don't give up on that. Don't give up on that marriage, okay? Well, um, that's where we're going to stop tonight. Um, 
we're going to talk a little bit more about some other. The subjects really get simple after this because we talk a lot about circumcision. I'm glad I'm not going to be here next Sunday night. We're going to leave that to Brother Hugh to deal with that subject. And <laughs> Well, the Bible does use that term because in the Old Testament, circumcision was kind of a picture of New Testament. What's the New Testament equivalent? Baptism. All right? A sign of the washing away and separating the flesh from the body, okay? And so that's kind of what it's about. And uh, Brother Hugh, you don't have to deal with that subject next week, okay? Um, but anyway, subjects don't get any easier. And uh, all these things we're talking about, Paul saw as problems in the church in Corinth. Corinth had some issues going on in that church. And Paul's having to address those issues, you know, uh, that's one of those churches that kind of like, you know, one I had one time that they said, why'd you leave? I said, because of sickness. I said, they said, why? What, was there a lot of sickness? I said, yeah, I was sick of them and they were sick of me. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, uh, that's what was going on in the church at Corinth. I think a lot of sickness down there. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed. You going to come pray for us on your birthday? You going to give us a good prayer? Take everybody home safe and yeah. all right, you ready? Yeah. Thank you, God, for everything. Amen. Amen. That's short and sweet there, Sam. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>